All right, hi everybody. So hopefully you've been sitting long enough if you just watched the first part of our um, lecture and we're gonna get moving and get active and learn some of the basic power moves. So we're gonna start with the four power moves that we just talked about and we're gonna take you through each of them and then we're gonna flow them together. So let's start with our power up. Power up is a position that you can get into before any of your activities or your movements to help get your patients into thoracic extension and prepared for whatever's coming next. So we're going to get our fingers nice and wide. We're going to open our hands up, get some nice external rotation, chest to the sky, and that's your power up position. Now we've got a nice wide stance, legs apart, and we're going to come down, relax, and we're going to do it three more times. So find your relaxed position and power up, and back down, and power up, and back down, and power up and back down. Very good. So that's the first one. We're going to go on to the second one, which is power rock. So let's get into our wide stance again. We're going to get those nice big fingers. I tell my patients, if I can't shoot arrows between your fingers, then they're not wide enough. So we're going to reach to one side. We're going to go all the way up rock. Now, if you can't tap your back foot, then you probably haven't weight shifted enough. Now, your patients may not all be able to do this because of balance issues or things like that, but if they're high functioning enough, then I usually get them to actually practice just a quick tap so they get the feeling. Let's keep those nice power hands. We're going to come back to center and we're going to rock to the other side. Power rock and center. Power rock and center. Rock, center, rock, center. Good work. So the next one we're going to do is power twist. So we're going to get those arms out nice and wide, fingers spread again, and we're going to twist all the way to one side, rotate, Clap your hands, come back to the center. So twist, clap, back to center. Twist, center, twist, center, twist, center. Make sure you're your patients are coming back to that big open center position before they twist. Now this may seem nice and easy to you, but what you'll find with your patients is it's not so easy and they're gonna self-select smaller movements than what you're asking for. So really make sure that they complete each movement that they're getting as big as they can if you need to stop them in one position and help them get a little bit further so their hands reach and they're not back here. Go ahead and do that. But really try and help them feel what it feels like to be as big as they can, okay? So the last of the four basic power moves is the step. So we're gonna come to center. We're gonna reach that foot way over and out and back to center. And the other side, over and out, and back to center. Your power hands go with it. What I tell my patients is think about stepping over a step, okay? Over something that they don't wanna trip on, and same thing when they come back, so that they don't end up with a little step and not very much range. So let's do a few more of those. We'll go over to one side, and back to center, and over to the other side, and back to center. Now, if you're doing these with high effort, you should feel that you're starting to get warm, and that's the same thing you would expect of your patients, high effort and high energy, okay? Now we're gonna flow them together. So we're gonna do them all together once. You can see one, this is just one example of how you can put these movements into a sequence. Now I'm gonna take you through the basics. We're just gonna flow them together once through, okay? So we're gonna come power up. We're gonna rock to one side and center, rock to the other side and center. Get into your big position and twist, back to center, twist again, back to center, prepare with your hands down and step, center, step, center. Good work. So that was flowing through all the basics ones. Now you can add in all sorts of different things. You can be creative with whatever's the most important for your patient, but that's just one way to flow the basics together. In the, practice, in the live presentation, we did it with music. Unfortunately, we can't do that because of the way we're filming right now, but you can also put it to music. You can put it to a metronome to make it more interesting for your clients. We know that metronomes and music and rhythmic activity is really good for people with Parkinson's and can sometimes make those movements easier. So that's a good way if your patients are having trouble or if you just want to make it a little bit more fun or a little bit uh, more interesting, you can add metronomes or music, things like that. We're going to go through a few of the boosts now. So let's talk about a few ways you can add boosts to these activities. So one that we're gonna do is fingers. So we're gonna get into our power position and we're gonna do finger flicks, which is just 
flicking your fingers out, imagining that you've got water on them, and you're trying to spray the water off your fingers. You want to come back to a nice clenched fist at the end. So we're going to come open, we're going to do five flicks. One, two, three, four, five. So nice and simple. You can add this on in your power up position. You could add it on in your twisting position. You could add it on in your rocking position. You can add them on wherever you want. You could do them straight out from chest height and sit in seated. Okay, lots of different ways to add them in. Now an example of something you could do with your eyes, you can direct focus of your eyes towards your hands. Now you can use targets, you can use other things. This is just again one example of how you can do it. So if we put our arms out for the twist, for example, we can direct our eyes to the hand that we're twisting to, and then when we come back to center, we can either keep our eyes there, or you can get your patients to come back to center. So let's do the one where we keep it, our eyes on our hand first. So twist, and then keep your eyes on your hand as you come back to center. Twist, <laughs> keep your eyes on your hand as you come back to center. It's harder than it sounds. Twist, keep your eyes on your hand. Twist. Keep your eyes on your hand. So that's just one example of how you can use your eyes to help coordinate movement and add it in as a boost. Now there's also breathing boosts as well as voice boosts. So let's just give one quick example of each. For our voice boost, we're gonna do some counting. So getting into your power position, we're gonna use power step for this. So you're gonna power step and you're gonna go one, center, two, center. You want a nice powerful voice but not straining. Now, if you want to make it a little bit more challenging, you can get your patients to, or your clients to count let, alternating between letter and number. So if we go one and center, A, center, two, center, B, center. Okay, and you still want to make sure that they're really focused on big hands and powerful movements. So that's an example of eyes, that's an example of hands, and that's an example of voice. One example that you can use for breath is just using deep breathing. So you can come into your power up, take a deep breath, and exhale. And again, deep breath in, and exhale. Getting a deep breath in that position is really good to expand the ribs in coordination with that axial extension. So that's just one example of how you can use your breath and integrate it into those movements. So now I'm going to show you one or two things that we do in our class and also ways that you can make these movements really specific and functional depending on what your clients are having trouble with. So one fun movement that I really like to use in our classes, and we do this with boom whackers, which you'll see in the pictures later. Those are little plastic tubes that have a musical note sound every time you hit them on something. And one thing that we really like to do with them is a posture where you have your hands up nice and big. Now I'm just going to do it with open hands because they don't have boom whackers on me and you're gonna come across the opposite knee, hit that knee, and back up to center. So that's just one example of a movement we use in our class. You can do it quick, you can do it slow, you can focus on balance on one leg if you want to get them to hold it there. But it's an example of making that, those big powerful movements and adapt, taking those big powerful movements and just adapting them a little bit to a fun activity that works well in our class. I'm gonna show you one more in seated. Now we know that sitting to standing is a transitional movement that people with Parkinson's very often have trouble with, so this is a great way to train that exercise and include those power movements in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back on our chair, you're going to bring your foot forward, you're going to flick your hands in front of you, and you're going to come up to your power stance. Once you're there, you're going to take big marches all the way around your chair using powerful arms until you're back to center, and then we're going to do the other side. You're going to rock back. Big and powerful, come up, and march the other direction. And back down. So that's just another example of one exercise you can do, how you can make it functional. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention in the lecture part of this presentation was that these patients, though they may be coming into your office, it may not necessarily be primarily for Parkinson's that they come to see you. They have a higher risk of falls, which may mean a higher risk of fractures, injuries, things like that, and they may actually come into your office with other issues. So it's a great chance, even though they may be coming in for something else, to address their Parkinson's disease and talk to them about exercise and what they're actually doing. 
Also, that may mean that they have other issues going on that you need to address if you're including these exercises. And there are tons of ways that you can adapt these exercises dependent on your patient population and their level of function. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's five different postures that you can do these activities in. So you can do them sitting, you can do them lying down, you can do them prone, supine, or kneeling. Um, we're not going to go over those today, but that's one way that you can adapt these for patients who maybe have lower mobility or have other issues going on that you need to address at the same time. So I just wanted to mention that before we go any further. Um, one more thing that we're going to talk about before we go to the last part of the lecture is that these patients need aerobic activity. Now these power moves and exercises can definitely be aerobic, especially if you're cycling them together. But also often we want these patients to have an aerobic activity they can do at home that's simple um, and that's cardio related. So often I get my patients doing pole walking. It's a really good way to include their upper extremity activity, something that they very often lose when they're diagnosed with Parkinson's or when they're living with Parkinson's. So with pole walking, one thing to maybe be aware of or keep in mind is that if you ask your patient to go walk for half an hour at a high intensity, the chances that they're going to last at that high intensity for half hour are, in my experience, probably slim. So what I try to do with my patients is give them intervals, with, um, depending on where they're walking, either outside or you know, in a gym, on a treadmill, whatever they're doing, give them an interval set where they're either doing it according to time or according to a landmark. And what I choose to do is I give them, depending on the function, but I'll try and give them every minute or every three minutes or five minutes, depending on how cardiovascular fit they are, or every time they pass a certain tree if they're walking outside, I get them to do 10 or 20 big power steps with the poles. What that does is it gives them, first of all, a comparison. So when they do these big, huge steps with poles, they can feel the difference to what they were doing beforehand, which is their normal self-selected size. And it also keeps them going back and forth. So they don't settle in too much into their regular pattern. They get those big moves on and off and they can keep it up for the entire the, um, duration of the workout. So that's just one thing to keep in mind when you're doing interval training with them. We often use a body weight support treadmill either at the hospital or also at NeuroAbility and it's a great way to give them a safe space to exercise and get active, a great place to work on training, things like that. But that may not always be accessible to you. If they're functional enough, you can get them to do a treadmill workout again with intervals or you can always have them biking if standing in balance is uh, difficult for them. So just be aware that there's lots of ways to adapt and wiggle with these to make them appropriate for your clients. Um, and now we're going to go back to the last part of the lecture. We're going to talk a little bit about the class that we run in our ability and also about resources in the community, what other classes are out there, what do our guide, Canadian physical activity guidelines say, and where are the places that you can go to learn more about these things and where can your clients go when they need help.